bow the knee. It's a good morning, and we're very glad that you're here today. Thank you for being at Lighthouse. It's warmer in here than it is outside. <laughs> we're glad that you're here. Hope you've had a great week. We've had a good time at Sunday school this morning seeing people. Hope you've had a good time at Sunday school and being refreshed by the people of God. If you're a guest with us, we are honored by your visit. We trust that you'll have a great time being refreshed in the Lord, serving the Lord, speaking the truth and love to one another. If you are a guest, I hope you got a good welcome from the Welcome Center. If you take the card you got from the Welcome Center, put your name on it, and just hand it back to them afterwards, we sure would appreciate that very much. A couple of announcements to remind you of. This Saturday is the Teen Youth Rally over at New Life Baptist in Converse. So you can check with Pastor Tim and Miss Christine about that if you have uh, questions about that, but that'll be this um, Saturday. The night before, this Friday, is the ladies' evening. And so these invitations have been going around for a while. I'm sorry if you didn't get one if you're a lady. They're out on the, the uh, table in the lobby. You're welcome to pick one up. Um, it's going to be a great evening. I encourage you to be a part of that. Dads and boys, make a, an opportunity for your wife and mom to get out and take care of things on the home front so she can be refreshed. You don't realize all the home-cooked food that's prepared for that, the Bible teaching that's been prepared for that, and the fellowship. Sometimes there's a craft, sometimes there's other things going on, but I'd encourage you, if you haven't been to one of the ladies' evenings, please come. You'll be really glad that you did. It's a great part of the ministry here. We do have a Master Club outing. Master Club is our children's program on Wednesday nights. We're going roller skating, and that's a week from Saturday. These flyers have been going out, so anybody that has kids in Master Club, your whole family can come to the roller skating outing. Uh, those flyers have been going out, and again, just don't want to leave anybody out, just so that you know about it. That's going to be Saturday the 27th uh, coming up. And then also wanted to let you know about the annual business meeting. Two weeks from tonight, the last Sunday night in the month, we have our business meeting. The proposed budget for this year, 2024, has already been at the sound booth for um, six or seven weeks. You're welcome to pick up a copy. And the idea behind that is so that you have lots of time to look at it, come to pastor, come to the deacons or whoever you're going to talk to and get your questions answered so we don't have to have a long extended meeting and we're not trying to hide anything. It has lots of time for you to get all your questions answered and um, the meeting to propose the budget and hopefully pass that budget and to go over some other items is two weeks from tonight. So we'd encourage you to be here that Sunday night. If you're a church member, you should be at the annual business meeting. There, I said it. <laughs> we encourage you to be here and ask that you would. Um, that would be a good thing. Um, the other thing is just gospel tracts. There's lots and lots of gospel tracts out there. I wanted to highlight these two. These are small ones. They have more of a cardstock to them. They're easy to put in your wallet or your pocket. This one has John 3.16, and it goes through the back. Um, just a really simple outline of how you can share John 3.16 with somebody. This one says there's four things God wants you to know. One is that you need to be saved. Two, you cannot save yourself. Three, God loves you and has provided the Savior. And then number four, God promises salvation to all who trust in Jesus. And it gives you the verses. It's not difficult. It's not hard. And it's, um, it's an easy way to share the gospel. So we encourage you to take gospel tracts and get the gospel to people um, all around town. We're going to start the service in a word of prayer, and then we're going to have a screen song right after that. Good morning. What a great way to start the week and with the body with Christ. Let's begin this with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us, Lord even for waking us up this morning to live in a free country where we can freely worship you. Even a warm building here today, Lord. More blessings than I can even name. And all things come from you, even though we don't deserve them with our own merit. And we're just borrowing them for a short time, Lord. May we be good stewards of what you've given us. Thank you for being amongst us <clears throat> as we gather around the written and living word of God, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his obedience on the cross for us lost sinners, being our salvation from condemnation. Thank you for a church and a pastor that gives your word preeminence and reads your law distinctly and teaches us plainly to understand. We also pray for the peace of Jerusalem as many are turning against Israel, Lord. We pray our country continues to stand by Israel as we know your word is true concerning blessings and cursings. We pray for our city, for our country, and our leaders, even this current administration who are pushing many policies against your word and destroying our Christian foundations. We pray for their salvation, most importantly, in a turn towards you. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? We know your word teaches judgment for such nations. 
We also know judgment must begin at the house of God. If there's to be revival or hope, Lord, it has to start with our churches. Expose the wolves in sheep clothing. Turn our lukewarm churches and pastors in our country to you, that they may teach your people the difference between the holy and the profane. Help us all to fear you. In all this, I pray for your will be done, and I pray for your will to be done today here with us. Fill our pastor today with the Spirit, and fill us with your Spirit and ears to hear your word, to apply it to our lives, to stand for you, and to bring the true saving gospel of Jesus to our community, to truly love them, of, of our, <clears throat> truly love them as ourselves. In all these things I pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. There's many different ways to start a church service. Sometimes it's big and bombastic. Today is Bow the Knee. It's going to be a screen song, so if we can have the lights for that, and the words are going to be right up here on the, there's so many songs out there that are great to sing, and uh, so we're going to start this service. What a privilege to come into God's presence. You can stand, and we'll sing to the Lord from our heart. What a privilege to come into God's presence. Just to linger with the one who set me free. As I lift my eyes and see his awesome glory, I remember who he is and bow the knee. Bow the knee, bow the knee. and our typical hymnal is our next song, I Need Thee. It's telling us, I need thee, the Lord, every hour. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. 435.
through the chorus just the voices. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. 438. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me. Help me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm worn. Take my hand and lead me, Lord. 438. Precious Lord, take my hand. to give of our tithes and offerings. We're thankful for your faithful giving here at Lighthouse. God is our provider, and we trust in him, and we thank you for your giving here in this place. One note that I did want to mention is that the Heralds are headed out this week to head up to Oklahoma, moving away. So if you didn't know that, spend a moment telling them hello. They want to be here Wednesday, but we're not sure. You never know what's going to happen with kids and weather and so on. So just to let you know, you can pray for them as they go on with their next step in life as well. Charles, would you come and pray for this time in the offering? Lord God, thank you for everything that you give us, Lord. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to be here again with our church family. Lord, I pray that you keep us all warm and safe during this time uh, this week with the cold weather coming in. And I pray that you bless this time of offering. I pray that you bless the gifts that are given, Lord. And I pray that you bless the hearts of those that give. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. We serve the great and marvelous God who does great and marvelous works. Let's stand. 371. We need to have a passion for him. We need to have a passion for the Lord Jesus. 371. Not just to serve, but to love him with all of our heart. Set my heart on you. Sixty-six will be our final song this morning. Kiddos, Children's Church is going to be in, so you can be dismissed if you're going there. We need the Lord. We've asked him to take our hand. We're passionate for him. Now let's let him have his way. What's holding you back this morning? What's weighing on your spirit? What's frustrating to you? Lord, I want you to have your way in this life. Don't sing it if you don't mean it. This is you and the Lord. Here we go. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, search me the potter, I am the clay, mold me and make me after thy will,
may be seated. Alrighty, turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter number one. We'll go over our memory verse. It's the beginning of the year, and where better to be starting the beginning than in the beginning? And if you would please, yes, out of respect for God's word, stand. Give everybody a second to turn there. Genesis, it's the first book of the Bible. It should be super easy to find, but there's all kinds of weird stuff in the front of so many Bibles that it takes you forever to find Genesis. I've been there. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. We'll go ahead and read it a couple of times, uh, and then we'll say it from memory. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. All right, we'll go ahead and read it over one more time. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. All righty, for those of you that are ready, we'll go ahead and say it once from memory. If you're not ready to say it from memory, by all means, so go ahead uh, and look down at your Bible. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. 
All righty, and our scripture reading is over in the book of Chronicles, Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 10, uh, verses 6 and 7. Second Chronicles 10, 6 and 7. Not Corinthians, that's in the New Testament. You'll get a very different verse. Give everybody a, a second to turn there. Second Chronicles 10, 6 and 7. Go ahead and follow along with me while I read out loud. The Bible says, And King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men that had stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, saying, What counsel give ye me to return answer to this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be kind to this people, and please them, and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you've blessed us with so much. Thank you, Lord, for all the, the, just the, the many things that you've given us. Um, when it's so cold outside like it is right now, I'm reminded and thankful for all the material blessings that you've given me, like warm clothes and a, a home and a heater and a church building where we can come to gather together where it's warm. But really, Lord, the, uh, the material blessings that you've given us are, are nothing compared to the spiritual blessings you've given us. Uh, I thank you, Lord, that you've forgiven me for my sin. Thank you, Lord, that you love me, um, that you've given me a home in heaven. I pray, Lord, that you might be with Pastor now, that you might just fill him with your power. I pray that you might help our hearts to be attentive, help us to seek, to learn from you and your word, and to draw closer to you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. It is good, be, good to be with you today in the God's house. If you're happy to be here, say amen. amen. It is a blessing always to be in the Lord's house with God's people, especially here in the new year. And uh, <clears throat> the weather has certainly turned wintry on us. Well, welcome to Texas. Amen. But uh, <clears throat> it is good to be in a, in a warm house with, uh, with God's people and just turning our attentions to the Word of God. So let's do that this morning. Every new year, the word resolution comes up. It's almost like you can't have a new year without that word coming up. I think most of us have made a New Year's resolution at one time or another. And I also think that those who have made resolutions have likely failed to keep most of the resolutions that they have made, if not all of them. Because of this, resolutions have become more of a joke than a reality over time. Kind of like the, the dad whose son asked him, Dad, what is a New Year's resolution? And the dad said, it is a to-do list you make for yourself that expires after the first week in January. I think that's how most people see it. We can relate with that father's answer because we, we would all agree that it is much easier to put together a list of things that I want to make better or do better in my life than it is to actually follow through and do those things that are on the list that we've made. Much easier to make that list than to do that list. And there's nothing new about this state of man. It has been this way since the time that man first fell into sin. We struggle with this idea of doing better or keeping resolutions. In our Christian circles, we allude to this state when we, see, when we say things like, you know, easy preaching, hard living. That's kind of the idea. We know what the standard is, what God wants for us, it's, but it's easier to understand the standard than to actually live the standard. The Bible doesn't use these kinds of terms but this condition of man is found in the word of God. For instance, in the book of James, we read, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. The words are different, but the idea is the same. Again, it is much easier to make a list of things that I want to do better than it is to do those things. It is easier to preach the truth than to live the truth. And as James says, it is much easier to hear the word of God than to do the word of God. And we find an example of this truth in our text this morning. The historical background or the historical setting of, the, uh, of this particular account is that King Solomon has just passed away. And his son, Rehoboam, has ascended to the throne over all of Israel. Solomon's reign had been one of relative peace. But that does not mean that the nation rested. Solomon had many work projects. He kept the people busy, not the least of which was the building of the temple itself, the building of, a, uh, uh, of his own house and his throne. 
He kept the people busy fortifying the buildings and, the, and fortifying the cities and building the nation itself. In fact, the tribes in the north felt that Solomon was working the people too hard. So upon his death, they came and petitioned, petitioned the new king that he would lessen some of these, this workload that his father had put upon them, that Rehoboam would lighten their burden, in other words. Look, if you would, please, at verse number four here in chapter 10. Thy father made our yoke grievous, they said. Now, therefore, ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of thy father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us, and we will serve thee. They felt like they had been overworked by Solomon. Being the new king, Rehoboam was not sure what he should do. And so he wanted some time to kind of think about it. So he sent them away for three days so that he could consider what it was that they were asking. So read with me, if you would, please, in verse number five. And he said unto them, come again unto me after three days. And the people departed. So he asked for this kind of respite, this time to think through what they have asked for. Now, his father Solomon had been known for his wisdom. We would all agree with that. And he wrote the Proverbs to his son, which likely was his son that was going to take the throne to Rehoboam himself. So you would think that given his father's example in his life, Rehoboam would possess a bit of wisdom himself. So we are not surprised then when we find that he wisely assembled Solomon's counselors to hear what they had to say about Israel's request. So in other words, uh, the northern tribes, Israel come down to, to Rehoboam at, uh, when he's being crowned the king and they say, hey, wait a minute, before we go through with all of this, we want to know what you're going to do with us. Are you going to lighten our load? We want our burdens lessened from those that Solomon had put upon us. And so he sends them away and he gathers the counselors of Solomon together, these wise men, and he says, what do you think? What do you think we should do about this request or really demand that the people have made? And these counselors did not open the Bible. They did not quote the word of God. Nevertheless, the advice they gave comes right out of the pages of Scripture. And as he listened to them, Rehoboam was really hearing God's word. So let's start there this morning with the idea of hearing God's word. The problem presented by the tribes from the north was more than just that they wanted to be treated better. They were also saying that if Rehoboam refused to change things, then they would not serve him as their king. Look again at verse number four. Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore ease thou somewhat the, the grievous servitude of thy father and his heavy yoke that is put upon us. And so if you do this, then we will serve thee. So this is more than just a request. It's more than just a demand. It really is a veiled threat, if you will. If Rehoboam did not lessen their burdens, then they would not serve him as king. That meant that kind of threat would undermine the king's authority and divide the kingdom. After all, if they would not serve him as king, then they would have to set up their own king to serve him, which would again divide the kingdom. And by the way, as it turns out, that is exactly what they were prepared to do. That this threat is implied in their request is likely the reason why Rehoboam didn't just answer right away. It's likely the reason why he, gave, he asked them to give him three days to think it through. Now notice that Solomon's counselors told the new king, the young king, that if he would heed their advice, which again, as we've already noted, comes right out of the Bible, that if he would heed the advice of, uh, of the scriptures, then the tribes from the north would serve him. The people from the north would serve him. Look at verse number seven again. And they spake unto him, saying, If thou be kind to this people, and please them, and speak good words unto them, they will be thy servants forever. They said, we're not going to serve you if you don't give us what we want. And, and now the counselor is saying, if you listen to the word of God and the counsel from the word of God that we are giving unto you, then they will indeed serve you. 
In other words, the kingdom would not be divided. The kingdom would be saved. And this is what they told the king to do. They told the king to be kind to the people. They told the king to please them and then speak good words to them. They are basically defining the biblical concept of, number one, servant leadership. They're defining the biblical concept of servant leadership. Now, that idea of servant leadership sounds like an oxymoron. It's two words that don't go together because they appear to contradict. If you are the servant, then you are, by definition, not the leader. If you are the leader, then it would seem that, by definition, you are not the servant. They are not the same thing. And that much is true as far as definitions go. And yet Jesus said this, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest, will be the greatest, shall be servant of all. So Jesus said, look, if you want to be chiefest, if you want to be first, if you want to be the leader, then you need to be the servant of all. Servant leadership. Not only that, Jesus is indeed the king of all kings. He's the leader of all leaders. He's the Lord of all lords. And yet he displayed this kind of servant leadership. He said to his disciples, "Ye call me master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, if I have served you, if I have done the work of a servant upon you, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Ye also ought to serve one another. I am your master. I am your Lord. You say that. You say, well, and yet I as your master, I as your Lord, have come to you and served you. Amen. He gives the example of what it means to be a servant leader. Now, this does not mean that Jesus did not lead them. This does not mean that he did not command them, that he did not rebuke them. Of course he did. He corrected them. Surely he did. But he did it all with a servant's heart. He did it all because he was more concerned about their welfare. To serve them, to make them better. He wanted to lead them in right paths. He wanted to lead them in the right way. That took some rebuking. That took some commanding. That took some splaining, if you will, as they say in the South. And so he did indeed lead them, but he did it all with a servant's heart. He was kind, in other words, just as the counselors had instructed Rehoboam to be. Look again at verse number 7. And they spake unto him, saying, If thou be kind to this people, just care about them. Just care about them. Be a servant leader to them. They also expressed the practical application, if you will, of the second great commandment. So number one, they, they talked about servant leadership, and they're talking about applying the second great commandment. The first and great commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. The second great commandment is thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. The command itself defines what it means to love thy neighbor as thyself. We are to love others as we would love ourselves. In other words, if we love ourselves, then we do those things that please us. So in order, to, in, a, in, a, in order to love others, then we need to do those things that please them. Amen? For instance, I would not serve myself pineapple. And all God's people said, amen. Because pineapple does not please me. But if my wife liked pineapple and it pleased her, then I would serve her pineapple, that which I would not do for me. In other words, it's not about pleasing me. It's about pleasing the other person. And that's the whole point. Love thy neighbor as thyself. The way that you would want to be treated is the way to treat them, to, to, to please them. And that is exactly what the counselors instructed the king to do. Look again at verse number seven. And they spake unto him saying, if thou be kind to them, just be kind to them, serve them. Be a servant leader and please them. Think about what they want. Please them. Do that which pleases them. Love them. Then lastly, they encouraged the king to follow the golden rule. 
The words that had been spoken to the king were offensive to him because they were again a thinly veiled threat. Now our first response when offended is usually to lash out and offend the offender by being even more offensive, right? So when you're offended, I don't like that. So I want to offend back. I want to offend the offender. But it's not enough to just offend the offender. I want to offend them more so they get the point to be even more offensive, if you will. That's usually how it goes. They say, you know, you want to give better than you got, right? That's the idea. But that is not what the golden rule says. The golden rule says, therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do even so to them. If you did not want to be offended when you were offended, then it does not matter that they offended you. You should not be offensive. That's a lot of offending going on. But I hope you followed all that. Look, do unto them as you'd have them to do unto you. If you didn't want to be offended, yet they offended you, then do unto them as you would have had them to do to you. They didn't do it to you. They did offend you. But don't do to them what you didn't want done to you. Don't offend back. You with me? That's the whole idea. Don't be offensive to them. And the king indeed had been, been offended. And so the, the, the counsel that he was received, look at it again in verse number seven. But they spake unto him saying, if thou be kind to this people and please them and speak good words to them. So in other words, they had spoken offensive words to him. And the, and the counselor is saying, don't offend back. Don't speak offensive words to them. Speak good words. Apply the golden rule to this situation is what they're saying. Do you see that? Don't do what you have received. Give what you would want. Rehoboam could not have asked for better counsel than what he got. He was given by wise men the word of God. Counsel that was taken right out of the word of God. Hearing these men, the king was hearing the word of God. Unfortunately, as we've already acknowledged at the beginning of the message, it is much easier to hear the word of God than it is to do the word of God. Much easier to hear God's word than to apply it to our lives. Rehoboam is an example of this truth as well. So let's talk about secondly this morning, doing God's word. Rehoboam had heard God's word. The, the, the advice, the counsel he got came right out of the word of God to be a servant leader, to, to lo love your neighbor as yourself and the golden rule. But the problem is always in the doing. We said that it is wise for the king, it was wise for him to assemble his father's counselors. And indeed, they did give him wise counsel. However, one act of wisdom does not a wise man make. And the king turned from the wise counsel of Solomon's counselors and did that which was foolish. So he hears the wise counsel in verse number seven, but look at verse number eight. But he forsook the biblical counsel that he'd received. He forsook the counsel which the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men which were brought up with him that stood before him. Apparently the king was in no mood to be a doer of God's word. And the end result of Rehoboam's foolishness, his foolish decision, would be to permanently divide the kingdom. That is what's going to come out of all of this. It's not that he could not do God's word. It's that he chose not to do God's word. And that is exactly the issue that we face daily in our walks with God. When it comes to doing God's word in our own lives, it's not that we cannot do God's word. It's that we choose not to do God's word. You see, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Whatever it is that God wants me to do, he gives me the strength to do. He gives me the He empowers me. I can do it. If I don't, then I chose not to. And the same with Rehoboam. It's not that he couldn't have done these things, the counsel that he was given. It's that he chose not to do the word of God. Why is it so much easier to choose not to do God's word? And we find some answers to that question 
in Rehoboam's example to, uh, uh, this morning, if we want to get better in our own lives at doing God's word, then we need to understand what is happening in our hearts that is causing us not to do God's word. You understand? So in other words, as we look at Rehoboam, I want us to see the obstacles that we face in our lives today that he faced as well. There's nothing new under the sun, as Solomon said. And so what he faced back then in his heart, we face in our heart again today. And these are the things that keep us from doing God's word. These are the things that cause us to say no to being a doer of God's word. And so let's talk about what happened with Rehoboam. Number one, to begin with, notice the answer of the young men that they gave. Look at verse number 10. The, the Bible says here in verse number 10, And the young men that were brought up with him that he turned to spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou answer the, men, the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made uh, our yoke heavy, but make thou it somewhat lighter for us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. For whereas my father put a heavy yoke upon you, I will put more yoke to your I will put more to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Good night. You see the king Rehoboam saw himself as the leader and the people as his servants. And it is the role of the leader to tell the people what to do. It is not the role of the people or the servants to tell the king what to do. It is the role of the servants to obey the king, whether they like it or not. That's the way he saw it. And so again, it is not the place of the servants to turn things around as they have done and demand that the leader should serve them. And so the old men had warned against this kind of view of leadership. This is apparently the view that he had because he liked what his friends were saying because they were essentially catering to that kind of idea. Who do these people think they are to talk to the king that way? You shouldn't allow that at all. And yet the leaders were wise enough to say, whoa, slow down. Don't see leadership through that lens. But again, the young men reinforced this understanding and so they were essentially saying, who do these people think they are? They're not the king. You are. They need you to show them who, who the boss is, to let them know who's in, who's in charge, to put them back in their place, so to speak. So the point is that we must be careful of any kind of thinking that looks down on others. So when it comes to our own heart and our own life, to understand what's going on in Rehoboam's heart and, and make that analogous to our own hearts, is we need to be careful not to look down. See, the point is, is that his servants were telling the king to look down on them. Look down on these servants that have come to you. You're the leader, they're not. They're the servants, they need to obey you, not the other way around. And in our own heart, in our own life, in our dealings with the people around us, we need to be careful of any kind of thinking in our heart that starts or begins to look down on others. Because when you are looking down on others, you will not do the word of God. You will not be a doer of the word of God. Rehoboam was not a doer of the word of God because he was looking down on these servants. We should always cultivate the heart of a servant. No matter how much authority we have over other people, we should always cultivate the heart of a servant. Again, that idea of servant leadership. We should seek to be kind to people, not to look down on them. As the, as the counselor said, be kind. And we could say, be ye kind one to another. And that's the idea. Any thought that leads to looking down on others will lead to not being a doer of God's word. Secondly, what's going in our heart that keeps us going on in our heart that keeps us from doing the will of God, from doing the word of God. I want you to consider that Rehoboam was given two options and he had time to choose between the two. Remember, he sent them away for three days. And so this was not a spur of the moment decision. He was able to think it through, to think about it. And the one choice was this, to follow the advice of the old men. And if he did, that would mean doing what he did not want to do. 
It would mean having to humble himself before these people that had come and made this demand of him. And he didn't want to do that. And that was option number one. Option number two was to follow the advice of the young men. That would mean doing what he did want to do, to put them in their place, to let them know that you can't come and make these demands. I'm the king, you're not. You don't like what Solomon is doing? Well, listen, it's going to be worse under my regime. Because you think that you, you have the audacity to come and talk to me this way. That's the kind of thinking that is going on in his heart and his mind. It was a choice between pleasing others or pleasing himself. Humbling self to please others or seeking merely to please himself. No matter how it made others feel. And so we need to understand that our strongest desire will almost always be to do the thing that pleases us. I wish I could kind of burn that into our hearts so we could understand that. If we're going to understand this idea and with Rehoboam as our example of why it is that we are not doers like we should be, easier to hear the word of God than to do the word of God. If we're going to understand what's going on in our heart, we need to understand that it is almost always, in almost every situation, our strongest desire to do the thing that pleases us. In other words, if you don't look out for number one, who will? So I need to look out for me. I need to do those things that, that I like, that I enjoy, that please me, that promote me. And so long as we are thinking that way, we will not be a doer of the word of God. So long as we had that kind of desire to please self rather than others. Because we are not loving others as ourselves. We are not keeping the second great commandment. I don't know any other way to say it, so I'm just going to reiterate it. Listen to me carefully. And whatever you do, whatever life presents to you, you will almost always want to do that which you desire the most rather than considering what pleases others. Your first desire will be to please self. And we need to understand what's happening in our heart so that we can overcome it, so that we can overcome that desire in our heart. We must be aware of that kind of thinking so that we can choose to overcome it. In other words, loving others as ourself is a choice that we make between them and us. It's a choice, a conscious choice. And our first desire is going to be for self, and we need to know what's happening in our heart so we can say, no, I want to serve them. I want to please them. Thirdly, Rehoboam was clearly offended by what had happened. They had not spoken kindly to him, and so he saw no re reason to speak kindly to them. Look down at verse number 13, if you would please. The Bible says, and the king answered them roughly. So when they came back three days later, he answers them roughly. He's not speaking kindly to them at all. Now, his counselors had said, speak kindly to them, but he would not do it. He spoke roughly to them, and, for, and King Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the old men. So he, again, as we said earlier, he had been offended and therefore, he chose to offend the offenders by being even more offensive. By being rough with them. By being unkind to them. Almost like saying, you know, take that. How do you like them apples? That kind of idea. What did King Rehoboam think was going to happen? How did he think they were going to receive that? Did he think that being even more offensive than they had been would stop the offense? It doesn't work that way. The point here is that we must see in our own life that no good can ever come from that kind of thinking. However, it is nearly impossible to think clearly when you are offended. Think about when you've been offended. And it's hard to think clearly when, you've, when you're offended. It's hard to even see the other person, the person who has offended you, in a good light. As though they too are created in the image of God. 
that they're no less a person than you are. It is hard to think clearly when you have been offended. Therefore, we must understand what is happening to us when we are offended. And what we first need to do, the first thing we need to do when offense comes to us is give it to God. You've heard, you've heard me say this before. It doesn't belong to you anyway. They're not going to answer to you ultimately anyway. So we need to learn how to forgive and give it to God. When that offense comes, we need to forgive it. Why? Because we don't think right when we're offended. And when we're not thinking right, we are not going to be doers of the word of God. Again, yes, we, we, it's easy to hear the word of God, but why is it we stumble at doing the word of God? And one of the reasons we do is because offenses come into our lives and we hold on to them. We don't give them back to God. We don't give them to God and say, Lord, this doesn't belong to me. Take this from me. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Great peace have they which love thy law. What are we talking about? We're talking about doing the word of God. To love the word of God is to do the word of God. If you're doing the word of God, then you will not be offended. But if you're offended, you will not do the word of God. You will not be a doer of the word of God. Offenses will come, but you don't have to be offended. Did you know that? It's hard to reconcile that in our brain, but it is true. Beware when you are offended. Again, so long as you are, you will not be a doer of God's word. You can choose not to be offended. You can choose to give the offense to God. It's not easy to do. But before we respond to someone who has offended us, we need to first stop and give it to God. Let me say it again. Our first response when we're offended is to offend back and to be even more offensive than the offender. So when we're offended, we want to offend the offender and to be more offensive to them than they were to us. That's our first response. Therefore, if you know that, if you understand that, then maybe the next time you get offended, you might take a step back and say, wait a minute. Before I respond, because if I do it in my own nature, I'm going to want to be more offensive. So I'm going to take a step back and say, wait a minute. Before I do anything, I want to, I want to give this to God. Because I know that if I don't, that this offense will cloud my thinking and I will not be a doer of the word. Easy to hear the word of God. Harder to do it. Why? Because of what's happening in your heart. And Rehoboam is a good example for us. Turn with me, if you would, please, to the book of James. and We're almost, done. We're almost finished. The book of James. James chapter number one. And look at verse number 22. I want you to see it. I know you know the verse and I've said it several times, but I, but I want you to get it in front of you. The Bible says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. Be ye doers. It's something that we have to choose to do. But as we have learned from our text this morning in, in 2 Chronicles, hearing the word of God is the easy part. Rehoboam heard it. It was easy for him to hear the Bible challenge. Be a servant leader. Practice the second great commandment and follow the golden rule. Listen, King Rehoboam, if you really want them to serve you, if that's, if that's your end goal, if that's what you want, then you need to be a servant leader. You need to practice the second commandment. You need to follow the golden rule. And all of that comes right out of the word of God. He heard the word of God. He was a hearer, but he failed miserably at being a doer of God's word. And so I ask you this morning, do you want to be a doer of God's word? Then we need to learn from Rehoboam's failure. Don't look down on others. Rehoboam did. So long as you are looking down on others, you will not choose to be a doer of God's word. Learn what it means to be a servant leader. You should always cultivate. You should always cultivate a heart, the heart of a servant. 
Always. Always be working on it. When you find that you didn't have the heart of a, certain, a servant in a certain circumstance, then go back and make a right if you're able to. But always cultivate that heart of a servant. Why? Why is that so important, Pastor? Because so long as you're looking down on others, you will not be a doer of the Word of God. You need to understand what's going on in your heart. Secondly, don't give, don't give in to your strongest desire. Your strongest desire is to please self. And so long as you're pleasing self, you will not be doing the Word of God. We must be aware of that kind of thinking in our hearts. It's always there. And we must choose to overcome it. We must choose to please others rather than self. And then thirdly, don't hold offenses. The king did. Even over that three-day period, he never let it go. Don't hold on to offenses. So long as we are offended, we will not be a doer of God's word. And Rehoboam was not. We can choose not to be offended. It is a choice that we make. You should choose to give the offense to God. How do I know it's a choice that we make? Because the Bible says, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Either that's true or it's not. What it means is that you can choose not to be offended. But you have to make the choice. You have to give it to God. Before we respond to offender, to an offender, someone who has offended us, we must first deal with the offense that we are holding in our own hearts. You need to let it go. You need to know what's going on in your own heart. You need to be able to step back and give it to God. So here we are. You've heard the word of God this morning. In other words, you've done the easy part. Now that you've heard it, what are you going to do? Will you be a doer of God's word? Not if you don't deal with these issues in your heart. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you this morning, I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you for these dear people. Lord, I thank you for their attention this morning. I pray, Father, that you take the truths of your word and burn them down into our heart. But Lord, I recognize that in many ways that's the easy part. It's that next step. Will I take that next step? Will I be a doer of the word of God? And Lord, in my own heart, and my own mind, Lord, I pray that you'd help me to seek to deal with the issues that are keeping me from doing your word. The same kinds of issues that Rehoboam faced. Lord, there may be someone here today who does not know you as their Savior, who has not come into the family of God, who's wondering what this, this relationship is all about, that we're talking about, about doing what it is that you want us to do, about being the kind of servant that you would have us to be. Lord, if there's anyone like that today, who if you were to say to them, why should I let you into my heaven? Lord, if they don't have a Bible answer for that question, then I pray, Lord, that you would help them to respond today, to be a doer long enough to hear the gospel, to know what it is that they need to do to receive you as their Savior. Lord, I pray that they'd have the courage to come. They can take a man with a man, a woman with a woman, and open the word of God and show them today how they can be saved. Lord, please anoint this service, anoint this time. Use it for your honor and for your glory. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Your heads bowed and your eyes closed.